Hey, y'all. In Louisville, Kentucky stands one of the most notoriously haunted locations in Appalachia. A bucket list location for any paranormal enthusiast, I was fortunate enough to be able to visit back in 2008. The experiences that I had there have forever shaped my belief in the paranormal. I'm Candace, and I'll be your guide. Nestled on a hillside in Louisville, Kentucky, Waverly Hill Sanatorium holds quite an interesting past that spans over a century. In the early 20th century, tuberculosis, also known at that time as consumption, spread its deadly grip across the nation and the world. To combat the disease and provide care for those afflicted, Waverly Hill Sanatorium was founded in 1910. The original structure was just a modest two-story wooden building, and it served as a refuge for approximately 40 tuberculosis patients at that time. As the pandemic intensified, the need for a larger and more advanced facility became evident. In 1924, construction began on a grand scale, giving rise to the iconic five-story, 180,000-square-foot Gothic-style building that is today's Waverly Hills. The new structure had a capacity to accommodate up to 500 patients, but Characteristically for medical facilities during this time, as we've learned from past episodes, it was forced to accommodate far more. At the height of the TB pandemic, it is estimated that approximately 6,000 patients occupied the space created for 500. However, Waverly Hill Sanatorium was a beacon of hope for tuberculosis patients. It was equipped with state-of-the-art medical facilities and progressive treatments of the time. Patients received access to fresh air, which was believed to be an essential element in the treatment of tuberculosis, through open-air balconies and patios. The building was also designed with large windows to let in natural light, creating an atmosphere that promoted healing and rejuvenation, at least as much as one could expect from a facility that saw as many poor outcomes as Waverly Hills did at the time. Among the at-the-time groundbreaking features of Waverly Hills Sanatorium was its innovative treatment methods. One such treatment was heliotherapy, which involved exposing patients to sunlight to combat the disease, which made great use of those copious large windows. The facility also housed a dedicated surgery room where medical professionals performed life-saving procedures and more modern cutting-edge x-ray machines that aided in the diagnosis and monitoring of patients. Of course, an early 1900s medical facility wouldn't be complete without an experimental treatment considered cruel by modern-day standards. Since TB ravaged the lungs of patients, it was theorized that removing some of their ribs may help their lungs to better expand, improving outcomes. Needless to say, this experimental treatment was unsuccessful, leading those who suffered this fate to just die in horrific pain instead. The commitment and the dedication of the staff at Waverly Hills was unparalleled, though. Nurses and doctors tirelessly cared for their patients, providing round-the-clock attention and support, despite the trying circumstances. The compassionate approach of the medical staff, combined with the innovative treatments, and, yeah, even the experimental ones, offered a glimmer of much-needed optimism for those battling TB. However, despite the best efforts of the medical community, Tuberculosis continued to take a heavy toll on the population, as well as those hospitalized. The disease was highly contagious, and isolation became a key strategy in preventing its spread. Waverly Hill Sanatorium, like other TB hospitals, had designated separate wings and floors for patients at different stages of the disease. The separation helped ensure that those in the advanced stages would not infect those in the earlier stages of treatment. Despite the best efforts of the staff, however, tuberculosis carried a staggering death toll, leading to the deaths of 63,000 patients at Waverly Hills throughout its course of operations. As the death toll rose from the pandemic, Waverly Hills was forced to construct some new elements of the sanatorium, such as a morgue that could hold several bodies at once, as well as what is called the body chute. The body chute is a long, underground tunnel that was used to transport deceased patients from the sanatorium 
to waiting hearses, ensuring discretion during the height of the TB pandemic, and preventing the loss of patient morale that would be the inevitable outcome from seeing numerous daily deaths of fellow patients. The tunnel, measuring around 500 feet in length, starts at the rear of the sanatorium and descends in a steep slope toward the bottom of the hill. The bodies of deceased patients were placed on stretchers or in body bags and transported down the tunnel on a mechanical rail system. This allowed staff to transport the bodies without the need to navigate through the main building under sick and prying eyes. The body chute was a practical necessity, but it is a chilling feature of the sanatorium. The tunnel is dark, narrow, and devoid of any natural light, creating a very foreboding ambiance. And after its usage had ceased, its reputation continued, creating a hotbed of paranormal experiences. As the decades rolled by, advances in medicine led to the development of the antibiotics that cured tuberculosis, marking a turning point in the battle. With the drastic decline in TB cases, Waverly Hill Sanatorium gradually became obsolete. In 1961, the facility ceased its operations as a tuberculosis hospital. In the years following its closure, Waverly Hills underwent several transformations. It briefly served as a geriatric center and later as a residence for individuals with mental disabilities. During its time in use for the mentally disabled, it added additional features, you could say, such as an electroshock therapy room. However, eventually, financial struggles and declining conditions led to its eventual abandonment. Despite that, Waverly Hill Sanatorium remained a center of attention for its hauntingly beautiful architecture and intriguing history. The building's already eerie atmosphere enhanced its developing reputation as a center for paranormal activity. Waverly has been the subject of intense interest from paranormal enthusiasts and investigators. Stories of paranormal occurrences have added to its appeal, making it a popular destination for those seeking to explore the paranormal. As I said, it is a bucket list location. One of the most commonly reported paranormal phenomena at Waverly Hills is the sighting of apparitions and shadow figures. Visitors have claimed to witness dark, shadowy figures lurking in the corners of their vision, only to vanish when approached or looked directly at. These shadow people are often described as tall and humanoid, leaving observers with an unsettling feeling of being watched or accompanied. Room 502 has gained notoriety as one of the most haunted locations within Waverly Hills. According to the legends, a nurse named Mary Hillenberg hanged herself in that room after discovering she was pregnant out of wedlock. Visitors have reported experiencing intense feelings of sadness, despair, and even physical discomforts when entering room 502. Some claim to have heard cries or whispers, while others have witnessed objects moving around on their own. It is even rumored that another nurse also committed suicide in that same room later on, although sources are not plentiful to back this up. EVP recordings made at Waverly Hill Sanatorium have captured ghostly voices and unexplained sounds. These mysterious voices often whisper or speak in a hushed tone, making it difficult to discern their messages. Some investigators have reported hearing desperate pleas for help while others have encountered mocking or malevolent voices. Another notable paranormal story involves the dancing ghosts or shadow dancers of Waverly Hills. Witnesses have reported seeing ghostly apparitions performing a waltz in the halls of the sanatorium. These spectral figures are said to glide along the floors, their movements graceful, The origin of these dancing ghosts remains a mystery, adding to the enigma of the sanatorium. Visitors and investigators have also reported various other paranormal occurrences, including sudden drops in temperature, unexplained footsteps, disembodied screams, and the sensation of even being touched or grabbed by unseen hands. Some individuals claim to have been scratched or bruised while inside the sanatorium, 
attributing these injuries to the malevolent spirits that are said to inhabit the building. Of course, no haunted location is complete without its own version of the creeper, an entity that feels darker than most there and is said to climb along walls and floors. The ghostly presence of a young boy named Jacob is one of the most well-known paranormal stories associated with Waverly Hills. According to the legends and accounts shared by visitors and paranormal investigators, Jacob is believed to be the spirit of a child who died at the sanatorium during its operation. The exact origin of Jacob's story is still unknown. Some believe he was a patient at Waverly who tragically succumbed to tuberculosis, while others suggest that he may have been the child of an employee who died within the sanatorium's walls. Many individuals claim to have had encounters with Jacob's spirit. Witnesses have reported hearing the laughter of a little boy, seeing objects move or being touched by unseen hands that they believe belong to Jacob. Some even claim to have engaged in conversations with him, describing him as playful and curious. Jacob's presence is often associated with the third floor at Waverly Hills. In this area, some visitors say they've seen the apparition of a young boy running down hallways or the sound of a ball being bounced. Commonly, a ball is used to play with the spirit of Jacob, with some investigators claiming the ball moves by unseen forces, sometimes even responding to requests. The body shoot is unsurprisingly the home to many of the paranormal experiences at Waverly Hills. Some report hearing the sounds of the old rail system that was used to lower patients to the bottom of the tunnel still in operation. Others report footsteps the sound of stretchers rolling, and disembodied voices and screams. It doesn't help that on the best day, the body shoot is dark, oppressive, and honestly very spooky, even without any activity. As I mentioned, I was fortunate enough to be able to visit Waverly Hills in the summer of 2008 for a paranormal conference way before my podcasting days. The conference offered me the opportunity to have two full nights in Waverly to investigate, along with meeting some of the paranormal world's most notable celebrities, like renowned psychic medium Chip Coffey, paranormal investigator Patrick Burns, author and demonologist John Zaffis, and most interestingly, Mark and Debbie Constantino. The Constantinos were considered to be EVP experts utilizing an extensive collection of haunted dolls and objects, combined with a technique of using running water as white noise to help enhance the number of EVPs they received. Meeting the Constantinos was particularly notable because years following this conference, the couple was killed in a murder-suicide perpetrated by Mark Constantino. During investigations at Waverly Hills, flashlights are strongly discouraged so that the group maintains night vision. For the most part, we only used lighting on the stairs, so we didn't die. <laughs> the ambiance of this massive building was enhanced by the sticky July night, the dirty and graffiti-ridden building, as well as a few bats that had made the building their home, gaining access through the few broken windows. The first notable experience I had was following the staff explaining to us that there was a notable spirit at Waverly who wore lilac perfume. It was said that at times, if you paid attention, you would catch the scent of her lilacs on the air. Sure enough, shortly thereafter, we caught the scent of a floral perfume in the air, but it was surprisingly strong, actually. And for me being the way that I am... <laughs> I'm still suspicious that someone intentionally sprayed it. It wasn't a hint of perfume on the air, it was a lot. In another instance, we joined a small group of people using an infrared thermometer. Now, remember, this is July in Kentucky, so it was in the 80s inside this building with no electricity. The woman was holding the laser thermometer steady in one spot on the floor, encouraging whatever entity we could potentially be interacting with to lower the temperature in that spot. By the time the session was complete, the temperature in that spot on the floor had plummeted from the high 70s to the low 60s. While exploring the body chute, we spent some time sitting on the stairs. 
To set the stage, when you enter the top of the tunnel, you see on the left there's a ramp with the remnants of the old rail system that carried the bodies down to the bottom of the tunnel. And on the right-hand side of the tunnel, there are stairs descending the entire length. The tunnel is at about a 45-degree angle down to the base, and again, it's 500 feet long. So we were sitting on the stairs on the right-hand side, about halfway down the tunnel, with two girls sitting on the stair behind us. Suddenly, they both screamed simultaneously and explained that they had seen something rolling or tumbling down the stairs rapidly toward them that disappeared as it got to them. At one point, we went into the building's cafeteria. I told this story in my Paranormal Stories episode, so you may recall this one. It's a large and, of course, pitch black room, and we sat down in the only two chairs in the room. And we're just kind of taking it all in when two guys join us there. They were just two average-looking young men, but something about them made me so uncomfortable. Something I couldn't explain or communicate well, but their presence was so unnerving. I leaned over to the person with me and whispered to him that I had a very bad feeling about those guys, and I wasn't sure what it was. I further explained that maybe one of them wasn't a good person, and I was picking up on it but it was a very disconcerting feeling that I had in their presence. After a few more minutes sitting there in my discomfort, we left the cafeteria to rejoin a group down the hallway. When we walked up to the group, the two guys from the cafeteria followed behind us. The aforementioned demonologist, John Zaffis, looked at the two of them and asked them, Hey, where's your friend? They were both confused and after some back and forth, finally explained that it was only the two of them together that night. John then explained, No, the two of you have had a guy wearing all black with you the whole night. Where did he go? This experience still gives me the chills when I recall it. There were two excellent EVPs that were captured one night at Waverly. One was mine, and another belonged to another person in the group. And I'm so sorry that I don't have either one of them for you to hear. The one I captured, unfortunately, was lost when my digital voice recorder died after the visit. Remember, this was 2008. In the one captured by another attendee, they asked an unknown entity if anyone harmed them while at Waverly Hills. They received a whispered voice in return that stated very clearly, the black nurse. For mine, we were in the electroshock therapy room, which again was created after the closure of Waverly as a tuberculosis sanatorium and in its brief lifespan as a mental health facility. We gathered around in an informal semicircle with Debbie Constantino leading the group. Debbie instructed us to all move in closer to her, and in my recording, there was a very clear voice whispering, No. The last thing of note is that our group used an ovulus device in an attempt to communicate with any lingering spirits there. The ovulus operates much like a spirit box, scanning radio waves that can supposedly be manipulated by spirits that can use it to produce sound. The thing I really like about the ovulus, however, is that it doesn't chatter constantly like a spirit box. It only pipes in occasionally. While at Waverly, anyway... Its input seemed to be surprisingly accurate. While in the body chute and the small field at the bottom, the device spoke up to say things like death, bodies, buried. There is a rumor that some of the bodies were buried in the field at the bottom of the body chute, as local funeral homes and crematoriums were just overwhelmed by the losses during the pandemic. The ovulus device did repeatedly state the word buried in that small field. Waverly Hill Sanatorium is definitely worth the trip for anyone interested in the paranormal, and I'm so grateful to have been able to go. The rich history backing the stories reinforces the intrigue, and it adds interest to touring the facility. I mean, it's a bucket list location for good reason. On size alone, you have 180,000 square feet which, by the way, is about 16,720 square meters, 
to explore and investigate, and it makes it entirely worthwhile. I hope to be able to make a return trip there for some hopefully new experiences. Okay, y'all, that's the story of Waverly Hill Sanatorium. Now let's talk about it. Of course, I have to make the obligatory statement about how 63,000 very sick and suffering patients died there, and it's the recipe for a haunting. Again, I'm so happy I got to go. Part of the joy was being at the conference and meeting and hearing from paranormal quote unquote experts. Meeting the Constantinos is something I'm definitely happy I got to do. Their EVP methods are really interesting. As I mentioned, they would use running water and use that as kind of a white noise background to get their EVPs. And this might make me sound like a crazy person, but I'm going to say it anyway. (laughs) But sometimes when there's running water, I feel like I hear murmured voices. So when they explained their method, it really just made a lot of sense to me. I really wish there was more known history about the period after Waverly Hills was used for TB and before it closed down. I'm curious to know more about its time as an elderly care facility and a mental health facility, but there's just not much information out there about that. I don't even know how long it served as each of them. The story about the man in black with the two guys in the cafeteria will stick with me forever. Whether it was simply a case of intuition, like maybe there was just something about one of them, or just my imagination, or something supernatural really was hanging out with those guys. Hearing someone verbally reinforce feelings from my intuition was haunting, and no pun intended this time. One thing that wasn't well solidified by my research or evidence are the stories about the fourth floor. Upon our arrival, the staff informed us that after hours when staff is in the sanatorium, it's common for them to encounter this oppressive feeling shadow entity that is so large they said it almost blacks out the entire hallway in front of you when it shows up. They also said the entity has thrown objects and injured people before. A couple people in our investigation group did have electronics battery drain. They claimed the devices had full battery before entering, and that very well could be true. It's just hard for me to not know these people whatsoever and put too much faith in it, but it's a good anecdotal story. I really do appreciate the ovulus device more than the spirit box. You guys, I freaking hate a spirit box if I haven't made that clear in previous episodes. They're a nuisance and a disruption. But the ovulus with it shutting its little mouth and only speaking when it has something to say, I can appreciate that much more. While my experiences were really interesting and definitely worthwhile for being there, I cannot objectively argue that much of our occurrences could not be ruled out by other factors. The infrared thermometer, I feel like we needed a control scenario, or someone else was monitoring the ground temperature in in another spot in that room to make sure it wasn't something naturally occurring, although it was interesting and does lead to the initial impression of the paranormal. Some of the other stories are subjective to a person's experience or to paranormal or occult technology, which, you know, has limited scientific backing. The EVPs that were received were pretty convincing, and it's so unfortunate I don't have those for you to hear. I do tend to put more stock into EVP than other evidence, though, if the situation is fairly limited as far as audio contamination goes. To be honest, the most terrifying thing that happened at Waverly Hills was when I sat down to take a little break by myself in a dark room and a bat landed on my knee (laughs) and I screamed bloody murder, leading other people to believe that they'd heard this disembodied scream. (laughs) However, all of this is not to say that I don't believe Waverly Hills is haunted. I do. Numerous paranormal teams over the years have gathered excellent evidence there under the best parameters that we currently have for paranormal investigation. Toward the end of two full overnights investigating there, I felt shaky, weak, and drained. It's hard to say what the cause of that was. I did work overnights at the time, so I don't think it was due to being up all night. 
but I can be sensitive to the energies of those around me, people and otherwise. It just felt very overwhelming after that much time. As always, I want to know what you think. Have you been to Waverly Hills? Do you have any thoughts about the third man in the cafeteria? Let me know. You can find me on social media as Obscure Appalachia or visit ObscureAppalachia.com for the podcast episodes if you need to. I have yet to mention that I also post every episode on YouTube, so if it's somehow more convenient for you to listen there, that is an option as well. Although episodes are posted on the podcast providers every other Tuesday morning at 5 a.m., so they will be there first. Hello to my very small but supportive YouTube audience. If you'd like to support the podcast and get bonus episodes, head over to patreon.com slash obscure Appalachia. Thank you as always for listening. Until next time. <laughs>